The Body Church is dedicated to proclaiming the good news of Jesus Christ through authentic worship, Bible study, and service. Located in Atlanta, we're called to create a loving and caring community for all people and work together for justice and truth in our world. Recognizing that our spiritual journeys are all different, we strive to help people discover where they fit and pursue their purpose in Christ. If you've been searching for a place where real people with real problems are searching for genuine solutions, The Body Church may very well be the perfect fit. Visit thebodychurchinc.org for service times or call us if you have any questions. Father God, we thank you so much for your truth. We thank you, Lord, that you are the resurrection, Lord God. You bring restoration to our lives, Lord Jesus. We just ask that you would be with us this morning. God, I ask that you would speak, Lord Jesus, as I present your message. God, I ask that you would touch every heart, Lord, that we would truly receive your word and that we would be changed, God. Thank you so much for your faithfulness, your mercy, your goodness, and your grace. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 All right, well, normally it's Pastor Donnell, my husband, ministering. So today you guys came on a day that I'm ministering today. So I'm very excited that Pastor Donnell has asked me to share. And um, I, I just want to... Um, mention a little bit about that video that you just saw. It's pretty powerful to see the resurrection, to see Jesus um, bringing Lazarus back to life. And sometimes we don't really think about, you know, the miracles Jesus did, and that's one of the ones that we kind of note, but we don't always um, remember or talk about it or even discuss the magnitude of what happened that day. Um, let me just mention a couple things here before I get started. Pastor Donnell just finished his series, um, 19, no, 20 sessions. He discussed God being fully divine and then talked about uh, Jesus as being fully man, uh, fully human, because he died for us. And then third, the word. Fourth, Jesus is love. Five, Jesus is the truth. Six, Jesus is the consummate leader. Seven, Jesus is our perfect friend. Eight. Jesus is the ultimate sacrifice. Well, I was thinking, and there's another one that I thought of, which is I'm going to talk about Jesus is the resurrection. And we talk, we're going to talk a little bit about that and um, just what the Lord's given me concerning this series that um, Pastor Donnell has just finished. So I want to encourage you to take notes and really think about what the Lord is saying and see how it can be applied to your life. So um, to get started, let's first turn to John chapter 11. And we're going to look at starting at verses 1 through 4. That's John chapter 11, verses 1 through 4. And we're going to read um, the account of Lazarus' death. See, I think I have it up here so we can look at, read that together. Great. All right, here we go. So let's read this together. Now, a man named Lazarus was sick. He was from Bethany, the village of Mary, and her sister Martha, this Mary, whose brother Lazarus now lay sick, was the same one who poured perfume on the Lord and wiped his feet with her hair. So the sister sent word to Jesus, Lord, the one you love is sick. When he heard this, Jesus said, this sickness will not end in death. No, it is for God's glory so that God's son may be glorified through it. Okay, so that was verse 1 through 4. Now let's jump down to verse 6 and 21. It says, yet when he had heard, excuse me, yet when he heard that Lazarus was sick, he stayed where he was two more days. And in verse 21, Lord, Martha said to Jesus, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. This question here. Well, actually, this statement that Martha gives to Jesus, it implies kind of the question of, where were you, God? If you had been here, this would not have happened. And we're going to jump down to verse 11, or excuse me, verse 25 through 26, just to set a foundation of where we're going. 
Here we are here. Let's read this together. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. The one who believes in me will live even though they die. And whoever lives by believing in me will never die. Do you believe this? All right. I think it's very interesting if you look here at this verse where Jesus promises will live even though they die. And then he asks her, do you believe this? The title of our message is the cave and the stone. And we're going to get a little bit more into why I named it the cave and the stone. But let's jump down to verse 39 through 11, or excuse, 39, 38 through 39, excuse me. And Jesus, once more deeply moved, came to the tomb. It was a cave with a stone laid across the entrance. Take away the stone, he said. But Lord, said Martha, the sister of the dead man, by this time there is a, has a bad odor, for he has been there for four days. All right. So let's look at the scripture one more time. The first thing here is when Jesus showed up on the scene, we all know the story because we just saw the account. When Jesus showed up on the scene, the first thing Martha did was she came and she said, if you had been here, this would not have happened. And that implies the question of God, where were you? If you had been there, this thing would not have happened. My brother would not have died. And then we see Jesus comes and he says, okay, he's moved. And then he says, where have you laid him? And what we, I notice here is that they say, we're gonna take, we're gonna show you where he has been laid. And there's a cave and there's a stone. And the first thing Jesus did was identify where was Lazarus laid. Then they told, then he told them, remove the stone. And so we're gonna be looking at the main points of this passage. The first thing is, whenever something happens in our lives, the first thing that Jesus does is he will come and he will identify what happened in your life. Where is that cave? And then he'll identify where is the stone put in front of that cave. I'm going to go in somewhere with this. I'm going somewhere with this. And then we see in Lazarus' case, after he identified where he had been laid, he had them remove the stone. And then he cried out with a loud voice, Lazarus, come forth. So the stone was removed. Lazarus, who had been dead for four days, now could come out of the tomb where he had been laid. And then we see a champion emerges. The man who had died came forth, this is Lazarus, bound head and foot with wrappings, and his face was wrapped around with a cloth and Jesus said to him, unbind him and let him go. So what we see here is after Jesus called him forth, he came out of the tomb and he, was, he needed to be unbound. Now let's go back to um, this passage. Would you turn to it in your, in your um, Bible there? And we see that Jesus said, said out loud, Lazarus, come forth. He called him by name. He said, Lazarus come out from the cave where Lazarus was and remove the stone from the entrance of the tomb. This was the prison, so to speak, or the dead place where Lazarus had been laid. Lazarus in the cave, he couldn't hear until they moved the stone. We see that Lazarus died, but then he came forth, he emerged victorious over the death that he experienced. He was victorious over this experience that he had, and the stone had to be removed first. And Jesus then said, this sickness will not end in death. He said that to, the, to um, Mary, and the story was not over. So when Jesus said, this sickness will not end in death, it was a prophetic utterance. Okay, I'm going somewhere with this. Okay, so. As I mentioned, I have titled this message, The Resurrection of a Champion, The Cave and the Stone. But before we can go any further into 
the message or any further into what the resurrection is all about and the title of my message is all about, we have to define what a champion is. And a lot of us in this room, we have been through various situations. We've been to, through different things and, you know, we've had victory in our life over many things that we faced. And this is true. We have been through a lot of different things. We have, you know, been set free. The Lord has set us free, truly set us free. But if truth be told, some of us still have an area or two that we haven't really dealt with. And that's the truth. You struggle with that area. And it's something that you, you know, you're a champion because you're living the life Jesus has for you. But every once and again, that one area or that two areas or whatever it is kind of comes up again. But a true champion, as we all know, is someone who has won in every area. I remember thinking about um, Manny Pacquiao and Mayweather. And the whole thing about they should fight and, you know, Manny was great and, pa and um, Mayweather was great and Mayweather, everybody, you know, said was wonderful and Pacquiao also said, they said he was wonderful too. But you had to kind of have them actually fight one last battle because you're a champion only after you've defeated all of your rivals, every single one of your rivals. So just for definition's sake, a champion is a person who has surpassed all rivals in a competition. A person who vigorously supports or defends a person or a cause. Okay? And that's from Marion Webster. So basically, in order to be a champion, you must surpass all of your opponents, all opposition. Not 90, not 92, a hundred, all of them. And as we search our own lives and our own hearts, we know that, you know, we're doing good. Some of us feel like, you know, I got this. There's this one little thing that I just can't, I can't seem to get rid of. And man, I really need some help in that area. Lord, if you could just kind of come in and help me with that. And this will allow you to truly be the champion or the person God called you to be, the person that when the Lord created you, and you were given your name, the name he gave you, when he dreamed of what you would be doing in the fullness of who you are. Also, a champion is a person who defends a person or a cause. So we see first, you know, it surpasses all rivals, but also defends a person or a cause. Your cause is your destiny. You are defending your identity. When I say identity, I'm talking about who you really are, who the Lord made you to be, not what society suggests you to be, not what the media says you should be, not what other people expected you to be, not any of that, who the Lord truly called you to be. What is your cause? What is your identity? So God has a plan for us. A lot of us love this passage. We're going to look at it together because it's the word of God and it's true. Jeremiah 29, verse 11 through 13. I love this passage. For I know the thoughts that I think toward you, says the Lord, thoughts of peace and not of evil, to give you a future and a hope. Then you will call upon me and go away, excuse me, go and pray, go away, go and pray to me and I will listen to you. Just stop and look at that again. We kind of rumble over this verse, like, yeah, Lord, you have a plan for me. No, 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 no. I know the thoughts that I think toward you, says the Lord, thoughts of peace, not of evil, to give you a future and a hope. Then you will call on me and go and pray, and I will pray to me, and I will listen to you. That is God's plan for the champion. His plan is a good plan. It's a plan for a future. It also means that he has something probably better for you than what you think you have right now. Even if what you have you think is good, or maybe it's not. The Lord has something better. He also wants to hear your voice. He wants to answer you, and he wants you to seek him 
but you have to seek him with all of your heart. I think that's verse 14. Yeah. And you will, you will seek me and find me when you seek me with all your heart. Verse 13. Okay. With all of your heart. That's a key point. We're going to talk about that. Yeah. Okay. Now, Satan has a plan for the champion also because you would be foolish to think God has a plan that's great, but the enemy also has a plan. And sometimes we don't realize that whenever we receive prophetic words concerning our life, directly from the throne of God, we, we grasp that and we believe that the Lord is going to do that. But we also forget that when it's released, the enemy hears it too. And he's like, okay. So God said, you know, you're going to preach the word, you're going to heal the sick, you're going to minister in song, and you're going to have a big evangelistic ministry and so on. And the enemy's like, check, I heard all that, and I'm going to do what I can to try to cut in front of those things. And that is, that is reality. That's what happened. That's what the enemy tries to do. We would be foolish not to realize that and be on guard. Um, and so as a result, yes, as a result, we need to know that the enemy's plan is this. The thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. That's all he comes for. But Jesus came that you may have life and have it more abundantly. So knowing that the Lord has a good plan for you, life, abundant life, he also has a future and a hope for you, you have all that, but then you also know the enemy has also a plan. He wants to steal those promises, steal that word. He wants to kill the dream, kill the vision, kill your identity, and make those things die. So let's go back to Lazarus' death. Turn back to John chapter 4. Let's go to John chapter 4. Is that right? Chapter, chapter, excuse me, chapter 11, verse 1 through 4. Thank you, Sister Sandy. I love you. John chapter 11. All right. So let's look at this again now. Okay, let's look specifically at verses 38 through 39. Verse 38, Jesus, once more deeply moved, came to the tomb, right? It was a cave with a stone laid across the entrance. The first thing Jesus said was, verse 39, take away the stone, he said, but Lord, said Martha, the sister of the dead man, by this time there is a bad odor, and he has been there four days. All right. So we're going to ID the cave and the stone. That was in that passage. So what does the cave represent? Cave is a natural underground chamber in a hillside or a cliff to fall in or down, especially from being undermined, or to cause to fall or collapse. So Jesus came to the tomb, follow me, where, where Lazarus was buried. Lazarus was buried. He identified the cave. Where is he buried? He's in the cave. Then he identified the stone that had been placed in front of where the cave containing Lazarus was and then Jesus told them to take away the stone so just to go back here we just settled that a cave is an underground chamber in a hillside or a cliff some to fall in or down especially from being undermined or to cause to fall or collapse okay keep that what is a stone stone is a hard substance that comes from the ground in stone in or into a permanent or unchangeable state. Stone, to make hard or insensitive to feeling in the Merriam-Webster Dictionary. Go back to the cave. So, we already said that a cave represents a dark place. Represents a place of, in this case of Lazarus' death, his hurt, his death, it was hidden. It was a place where Lazarus, who Lazarus is or was was buried he's put in the cave for us a cave represents an area of pain 
in our heart. A stone, as we mentioned, we defined earlier, is a hard place. It's hard, it's made of rock. It's what's placed over a cave to keep people out. In this case, to keep Lazarus hidden, to keep the odor of death inside, to keep the smell out, not to draw distraction, draw any attention to. So you have a tomb that's a cave with a stone. You still with me? For us, our stone is a place or something that we put in front of a hurt to compensate for the pain in the cave, in the heart. For a champion, as I said before, it's all or nothing. A champion is a person, as I said before, who has faced every challenge. They have beat every rival, every opponent. You can't be a champion if you've not overcome all of your opponents, all of your rivals, unless you've overcome everything. You can't defend your cause. Remember I said your cause is your destiny. That is why you exist. Your identity is the very who you are. In this case, we saw Lazarus, he died, right? We saw Mary say, Lord, if you had been here, this would not have happened. And Jesus still waited, but he went. We also see that in the midst of that occurrence, after the pain happened, in this case, it was death. Jesus still said, this sickness will not end in death. We see then that Lazarus was laid in a cave and a rock was placed over it. Jesus came and said, remove the stone so I can get to that place in the cave. The cave represents our, a hole in our heart. Some of us have one, some of us have two caves, some have three caves, and stones all over it. Even the deep secret hurt or pain that happened to you, if we put a stone over it, we can still survive. Some of us have been in situations in our life where, and it could have happened as a child, it could have happened as an adult, it could have happened in, in both cases, where in the moment of that event, there was a, God, where are you? Why is this happening? If you had been here, right. this would not have happened to me. Where were you, God? That's what Mary said. If you had been here, but Jesus said to her face, yeah. this sickness will not end in death. See, right. death might come, but it didn't end right. in death. Now, look again at Lazarus. Lazarus died, put in a cave, stone covered, Jesus came. It did, he said it will not end in death. We're still going. All right. So champion, as I said before, is a person who has surpassed all of their rivals. And a lot of us have had real rivals. I don't know about you. I have had real stuff go on in my life. I mean, serious. I've had real things happen, and it's one of those things where you're going along, you're living the Christian life as best as you know how, you know? You're not perfect, but God, I'm doing it. I'm all in for you. And then all of a sudden, 
Something comes out of left field, right field. You didn't plan. And what happens in that moment, it's a, God, where are you? And you're crying out. Mary sent for Jesus, and he got word that Lazarus was not dead. He was sick. So the word came to Jesus, and Jesus was in another place. And in that time, he knew, okay, Lazarus is sick. And they were like, come quick, because you know this might be it. Okay. He waited a couple more days. In our situation, sometimes you've been in stuff. And I know I'm talking to at least one person in this room, if not myself. You've been in a situation where it was, God, if you don't come now, I am not going to make it. And this could have been in your adult life. This could have been in your childhood. Lord, why is this happening? God, I'm crying out. If you don't come, I am not going to make it. And then what happens? It takes time and he doesn't come. And what happens that day? A piece of you dies. A piece of who you truly are dies. And what do you do? You put it in the cave. The cave in your heart. Remember we said a cave, it's a hollowed out place. And there's nothing you can do about that. Like you, you get hurt. There's boom, that really hurt my heart. But you gotta survive. You gotta keep going. And what do we do? We put a stone over the cave so we can function. Let's keep going. So what happened? Let's look at Galatians 5. Here's a scripture here. You were running a good race. Who cut in to keep you from obeying the truth? What sickness or pain or situation were you in or are now in that you prayed to God, he did not answer in the midst of that. And in the midst of your pain or your situation or injustice, a part of you died. You lost a piece of yourself. Your voice, maybe, your faith, something was lost. Maybe your boldness was lost, your confidence. You lost it that day. Your dignity. What is it that you lost? Where was God? Where were you, God? Where was God? Where was God? Perhaps some of these were the situations you might have faced. <coughs> You're crying out in the midst of a rejection. If you had been here, this would not have happened. You were crying out in the midst of a financial struggle and you lost property, car. If you had been here, this would not have happened. My parents would not have abandoned me. If you had been here, God, how could this happen? My mom, my dad, they passed away tragic accident. If you had been here, I would not have been abused. If you had been here, God, didn't you see what was going on? I, I called out for you. If you had been here, I would not have been beaten like that or would not have been raped like that. If you had been here, I would not have had heartache. That person would not have left me, broken up with me, took stuff from me. They would not have cheated on me. God, where were you? If you had been here, God, where was my dad, God? I asked for him. If you had been here, God, if you listened, maybe he would not have left, God. Where were you? I didn't get that job. I didn't get that college opportunity I wanted. Where were you, God? Where were you, God? Truth is, God saw it all. Amen. That is the truth. God saw it all. And a lot of times, we don't, it's hard to believe, like, well, why did he watch? Like, why didn't he do something? But like Lazarus, Lazarus was sick. He hadn't even died yet. In your situation, when you were getting beat or whatever you're going through, or when you were being abused or, 
or when, when you're being rejected or lied to or, or when you were homeless or whatever it was, God, I'm sick right now. I need you right now. If you don't come, God, I am not going to make it. I am going to die. This thing is going to kill me, God. You got to come now. And what happened? A piece of you died. The piece of who you really are died in the midst of that time. The crying out. So there was a cave created in your heart. Maybe multiple. And what do we do? We have to survive. But God, where were you? You cried out to God before you died. That piece of you died. You were walking in the shadow of death. You weren't dead yet. God, you got to come. I'm not going to make it, God. I'm not going to make it, God. That was Lazarus in the shadow of death. He was sick. It was a shadow of, he wasn't dead yet. In the shadow of death, they called for Jesus to come. And he didn't come in their, uh, in their calculation quick enough. So when he came, the first thing she said was, if you were here, that would not have happened to me. Lazarus would not have died. I would not be mourning for my brother right now. He would not be stinking up a tomb right now. Where were you, God? He saw it all. We know that because Psalms 23 tells us, Yea, though I walk through the shadow of death, thou art with me. Right? I will never leave you nor forsake you. But where were you, God? I didn't know. I didn't see you. I was still in that situation. Isaiah 43 tells us this. It's a, this is a promise. When you go through the deep waters, when you go through the deep waters, I will be with you. When you go through the rivers of difficulty, you will not drown. When you walk through the fire of oppression, you will not be burned. The flames will not consume you. This does not say if anywhere. If is not even a, in here. It says when you go through the waters, because God said when, that's, a, that's saying is, 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 there's a time for that. Not that you're in that for any punishment or whatever, because we live in a fallen world. And our life is also affected by other people. Yeah. And people are broken and fallen, and we are all broken. So sometimes the person that was supposed to love you well, they didn't know how to do it. I heard someone say, if you don't know the use for something, you will abuse it. Period. You can give a kid some car keys. They're not going to go drive a car. They don't know what to do. They're going to eat it. I mean, if you don't know the use for something, you'll abuse it. So maybe that person didn't know how to love you well. Maybe your father wasn't there, and he didn't know how to be. Maybe his father wasn't there. And again, God didn't cause your dad to be that way or your mom to be that way or whoever you trusted in to abuse you, these are fallen people, fallen situations. And you just are in this situation. And people who God has entrusted you to, maybe they don't know better. So as a result, you will go through some pain. You may cry out to God, and it didn't just come as quick. And God, if you don't come, I'm not going to make it. And then boom, a cave. My heart is hurt. God, you didn't show up. You let me down this time, God. But God saw it all. When a cave is developed in our hearts, we cover it up. A hundred percent of, of the time. How can I say that? Well, let me just go here, shadow of death. We talked about that. Whenever you see a tomb back in the day, whenever you saw a cave, if there was something dead in there, there's a stone. A hundred percent of the time, when we have a cave in our hearts, some kind of pain, a hundred percent of the time, we cover it up. A hundred percent of the time, there is always a stone. If you have a cave, the result of something that happened in your life, there was a disappointment, a pain, a rejection, an abuse, someone let you down, the dog ran away, whatever. Something just, boom, that really hurt my heart. You got to continue focusing and living your life. You will put a stone. You cannot tell me 
you would not do that. And if everybody in here, this isn't for you, it's for me. <laughs> if there's a cave in my heart, I know I have a stone. Right. I know it. Because I got to live, I got to survive. So what's your stone? Really think about it in your life. Because, you know, truth is, praise God that we're all, you know, saved and love Jesus. But also the truth is, we've been through stuff. Some people have been through real If you sat down and talked to some people, they tell you some of the valleys they have walked through barefoot and the Lord has brought them out. You would not believe that that person is even, a lot, even sane. You would not believe. If people were to keep it real and actually say, you know what, yeah, I got some caves and I need God to help me take away the stone that I put on the cave because inside that cave, that's where I really am. That piece of me that died that day, that all of a sudden I'm not walking in the fullness of who I am because of that thing that I keep dealing with that, you know, I know about it and God knows, but nobody else really know. And I'm just going to keep the stone on top so I can function and keep surviving. If you were to keep it real, people will get free. So what's your stone? Is your stone anti-socialism? I just anti-social. I didn't always used to be that way. I'm just, you know, I just don't really talk. I don't trust people that much. I'm just to myself. And all, all this time, everybody has known you as a quiet person. When the truth is, at 16, something happened to you, and then you created a, there was a cave because your heart was hurt. And you put a stone, and you said, you know what? If I just keep quiet, maybe they won't notice me. And maybe I won't get hit again or hurt again. But, oh, she's so quiet. Oh, she bless, bless her heart. No. 15, 14, 13, 12. She was very talkative, creative, outgoing. 16, she got hurt. But you met her at 20, and she's always like this. And you think that's her temperament. No. There was a cave, and there was a stone. Are you just angry? Angry, 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 angry. Angry, 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 angry. angry. And nobody knows why you have these anger bits. And you've really never talked about it or dealt with it. But maybe at 18, your parents did something that really got you upset. They moved to a new whatever. And now you had a babysitter or whatever. You didn't see your dad anymore. And you're just angry, angry, angry. But you manifested as anger. But the truth is, there's a cave in your heart you haven't dealt with. And the stone is anger. If I'm just angry, nobody can get in. I'm good. And you're known as a person that's angry, but that's not who the Lord created you to be. That's not the real you. Maybe it's alcoholism. Maybe it's pornography. Maybe you're afraid and timid. You, you just, and it's, that's not how God made you. There's a reason that you're like that. Or your stone is busyness. Look, I've been hurt too much. If I just keep busy, 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 I don't have to think about the pain, and I don't have time to get hurt again, I'm going to be busy. And everybody said, man, man, he can really work. Boy, he's a workhorse. He's just busy doing everything. Oh, he'll do it. He can do it. He can get There's a cave. All right. There's a stone. <sighs> Unforgiveness. You don't know what they did to me. If you knew what happened to me in the back room when I was 12, I'm not forgiving them. I don't care, and I don't want to talk about it. And you're holding that. Nobody knows about it, but you're just holding the unforgiveness inside of you. You put a stone on it. You never dealt with the pain, the cave. Or you didn't even forgive yourself. Some of us deal with that. Like, you do stuff, you shock yourself to the core that you would ever do that thing that you would consider that is so low man I didn't know that I had that in me and you cannot forgive yourself same the cave stone but you functioning everybody's oh she got it together he got it together God knows Amen. and you know that there's a cave the cave is a tomb who you really are is in that. That piece of you is in there, and there's a stone. Cynicism, you don't trust nobody. Drugs, alcoholism, 
even religion and self-righteousness could be your stone. You're walking around and you're extra, pretending, pretending to be extra holy, extra this, extra that. That and other people, if they're not like me, then pff, they need to get theirs together. And God's like, really? I saved you too. If everybody knew how many caves you got and how many stones you got, and your stone is, well, you know, I read my, I read my Bible 50 times a day, and then I read the concordance to go with every chapter and so on and so forth every day. But there's no life. You're just doing it as a religious ritual, as a duty, and you still feel broken inside. It's a stone. It's a stone. Maybe sex. Sex is your stone. Distrust, you don't wanna trust anyone because the last time you did that, you got hurt. But check this out. Jesus says in Ezekiel 36, 26, I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit in you. I will remove from you the heart yes. of stone. All right. Because your heart has caves and you have one stone, two stone, ten stone, half a stone, 1.5 stone, whatever you got. There's pebbles, whatever. There's stones in your heart. Your heart is not fully flesh. But God says, I will remove from you that heart of stone and give you a heart of flesh again. If we were to be honest, some people really have stones. I know I had some. Thank God he got rid of them. But I'm saying, like, you, you get these caves in your heart from small from teenage years, from adolescence, because stuff just happens. People just don't love you well, or you don't love yourself well, or you get rejected, your dad wasn't there, or you know, you just sad, you know, it's just, you just go into a depression. That's your stone to woe is me and the whole thing. Like, that's a stone. But God says, I want to take those away. When he went to Lazarus' tomb, the cave where Lazarus, the real Lazarus, was dead inside with a stone. The first thing he said, show me where, where, they, where he's buried. They took him to a cave. And then Jesus said, remove the stone. The resurrection. So, going back to John 11, 25 through 26. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. The one who believes in me will live even though they die. And whoever lives believing in me will never die. Do you believe this? This is the part here. Will live even though they die. Even though you went through some stuff. Because nobody has gone through no stuff. And I think that's improper English, but you know what I mean. Everybody has gone through something, whether you went through it because your decisions made you go through it or because the people you trusted who were the covering for you, they, they put you through it. And you may have cried out to God, like, you know, God, where are you? If you had been here, God, and then that day a piece of you die, a piece of who you are, your dignity, your boldness, your confidence, your purity, whatever it was, was put in that cave. And then you had to survive. So what'd you do? I need, I need a stone. I, I got to put something over it because it's going to start stinking up the place. I can't function. People are going to find out about it. And I just got to keep going. I put a stone on it. Then it plug it up and I, I can at least function. But the truth is that cave has a piece of who you are, your identity, the fullness of who the Lord called you to be by name. Mm -hmm. A peace went in there. And that is because the enemy came, stepped in, in that moment. Because the scriptures, Galatians, we just read it. Who stepped, who cut in front of you to keep you from obeying the truth? The truth of who you are. Who, who cut in? Who did it? And a lot of times, 
you know, maybe we did it. Or maybe someone else did it, but we blame maybe ourselves, you know, yeah, that happened to me because, you know, me, I did that, I talked too much, I dressed too sexy, I da 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 I da 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 I, it's my fault. God's like, who, who cut in? Who was that, who stepped in? We had it going. I had it for I know the plans I have for you, and you're going, you're going, all of a sudden, boom. I didn't expect that person to come from right field, steal from me, take from me. And you had to survive. God, you didn't come. Man, you really let me down that time. I got this. Let me get a stone. Let me, let me get a stone. So what happened? When Jesus came to the tomb where the fullness of who Lazarus was was buried, he said, remove the stone. Remove the thing that you put in that place to keep the ugly darkness inside that cave of your heart. Remove that stone because I want to call you so you can hear me from that place. Because as soon as the stone was removed, Jesus then called Lazarus. He said, Lazarus, come forth. And then he came out. He didn't do it with the stone there. Our hearts have caves and stones, all different sizes and whatever. Some of them old, old stones. Big stones, little stones. But we have them. So Jesus wants to remove from your heart the stones. And he wants to give you a full heart of flesh. So right now, I want everyone to close their eyes. 